Patrick, thank you for coming on the show. Thanks very much, Ken. Good to be here. Yeah. So uh, we were just we were just catching up before we started recording, and uh, I was actually introduced to your work uh, from a previous guest, Christian Placencia. Actually, if, if people hasn't li- listened to that one, go back. It's a really good one. Um, and he was kind of so uh, inspired by a lot of the work in your book that, in addition to other research that he's done, he's incorporated a lot of these techniques into his like overall program for helping create, uh, you know, quote unquote, what they call a more durable athlete. Um, and so I absolutely was was interested, uh, you know, in something that was so motivating for him, went out and got the book and I've just, I've absolutely been tearing through it. I'm, I'm really enjoying it. So, um, and, and when did you write The Oxygen Advantage? I started writing it in around 2011, 2012. Oh, wow. And okay. um, because I'm like, I'm working in the field almost 20 years, but I was working mainly with people which who were unhealthy. Yeah. People with asthma, people with anxiety, people with sleep disorder, breathing, people, I was working with some people that wouldn't be able to walk up the stairs. Hmm. Um, and then in 2010, I started giving out courses on mindfulness and functional breathing for focus and performance and also dealing with stress post economic crash. Oh yeah. And 90, 90% of the people coming in were female. And very few males were coming in. And I was intrigued because males are the one that often don't do so well in terms of mental health. And yet Mm. they weren't attending a breathing session. So lo and behold, I wanted to start putting breathing with performance and adapting to it. And that was the whole essence of the oxygen advantage. And the uptake is mainly men. It's mainly men between the ages of 20 and say 45 years of age. And huh. it's people putting it for performance base. So both for the mind, for sleep, for heart rate v- variability, for resilience, recovery, and also for exercise performance. Now we're, we're changing it slightly because I've just written a new book called The Breathing oh. Cure, which is going to be out in the next six months or so in the United States. Oh, we'll perfect. Have it, we'll have it in Europe in the next two weeks. And that's looking at the application of about 26 to 30 different breathing exercises. Hmm. designed to tap into different disciplines you know we have sections for women because female breathing is very much different to men and even though this has been written about since 1905 and there's very little research on it because most of the research done on breathing is done by men and it's really important that female breathing is is you know that it's adapted differently and other health conditions Hmm. diabetes epilepsy functional movement because functional breathing and functional movement go together yeah. And if breathing is off, movement is off. And if movement is off, there's an increased risk of injury. Sleep apnea, Ken, which is very common. And it's common oh, regardless yeah. regardless of whether the guy is a top athlete or gal is a top athlete or not. It affects more men than women, but it puts a tremendous pressure or stress on the heart, linked with many different conditions. But most definitely, if one has obstructive sleep apnea, you don't wake up feeling refreshed. And there's yeah. no way on earth that you can focus and perform your best if you haven't had a decent night's nice sleep. And also heart rate variability is going to be impacted. So I suppose we have to consider the breath. The breath has had a bad rap for many years. Hmm. And most notably because it was taught by people, number one, that often didn't have an understanding of breathing. Number yeah. two, followed a tradition and stuck with it like a guru without looking at really what can we do about breathing and this is not just for tree huggers you know it's not for the guys going around with the open sandal brigade i've worked with military we've worked with swash some of our instructors are swash we've had instructors from delta forces attend the training courses we've had corporate corporate leaders and you know i suppose the one thing is breathing is a function that when we change it we can influence other functions in the human body. And I think it will Mm. influence more functions in the human body than any other modality that we can do, more so than physical exercise, etc. And there are exercises, of course, to downregulate. There's exercises to upregulate. There's exercises to improve your blood circulation, improve your oxygen delivery, decongest your nose, improve your sleep, and also stress the body. You know, 
like we dropped blood oxygen saturation down into the mid 80s and down into the 70s. I don't want to go below that because there's a risk of passing out. So there's a degree to which I want to stress the body, but I don't want to overdo it at the same time. You know, so, yeah, yeah. I think it's really interesting. Breathing now is finally getting out there. So understanding that a lot of breath work traditionally was taught, like you said, by gurus, people who are either like steeped in tradition um, or had, you know, their own, I don't know if dogmatic approach is the right word, but, you know, what about your kind of exposure to breath training uh, kind of set you down this path of, of taking a more innovative scientific approach? Well, I suppose because I was teaching mainly in health oriented um, and a lot of the work was presenting at conferences, dental mm. conferences, conferences who were attended by healthcare professionals. And in order for me to, to make a statement, I had to be able to support it as best that I could. Now, granted, the science is only starting to catch up in terms of breathing. Hmm. And there's things that we've been using with breathing 20 years that we're starting to see papers now in the last five years. For example, breath hold time yeah. as a screening protocol for functional breathing. One professor of physical therapy, Professor Kiesel, in 2017, he'd conduct, he conducted a study, 51 individuals, and they were 27 years of age. And he looked at their breathing from a number of different dimensions, biochemical, biomechanical, and psychophysiological, and concluded that if the breath hold time, which pretty much was described exactly as the bolt score, you take a normal breath in through your nose, a yeah. normal breath out, you're pinching your nose, holding your breath, and you're timing it in seconds until you feel the first definite desire to breathe. If your breath hold time is above 25 seconds, there's an 89% chance that dysfunctional breathing isn't present. So hmm. with that, and, then, and, and, and apologies for interrupting, is is that uh, a good definition of of the Bolt score for people listening? Yes. Is that yeah? Yeah. Now, and I can go a little bit more detail. You should be sitting down, resting for about five minutes before you take it. Mm -hmm. You have normal breathing before measuring the breath hold. Yeah. Don't hyperventilate because if you hyperventilate and you get rid of carbon dioxide, obviously your breath hold is going to be longer. Uh, so you have a normal breath in and a normal breath out, and you hold your nose. And you time it in seconds until the first involuntary movement of the breathing muscles are the first definite desire to breathe. Hmm. So you, and when you resume breathing, your breathing should be fairly normal. So it's not the length of a maximum breath hold, but it's the right. length of time. How long does it take for your brain to react to the fact that you've stopped breathing? Hmm. And, you know, that gives us, <laughs> <That's crazy. laughs> that gives us some idea of the chemo, what's called the chemo sensitivity of the body to carbon dioxide, but it's a good measurement of breathlessness as well. Hmm. So say for example, like I've seen Olympic athletes with a breath hold time, a bolt score of 10 or 11 seconds. Now these oh, wow. guys achieved what they wanted to achieve, but they pushed their body through hell to get there. Because hmm. If you have a bold score of 10 or 11 seconds, it's implying that you have dysfunctional breathing patterns. Your breathing during rest is faster. You're more upper chest breathing. You're not economical with your breath. You're breathing inefficiently. You're wasting energy yeah. because there's a cost associated with breathing. And it's your everyday breathing that determines how you breathe during sports. So, you know, your breathing is not just going to fix itself when you go for a run. How you yeah. breathe during your run is determined by how you breathe the previous, you know, 24-7. And ah, okay. even if we think of people, how are they breathing during sleep? 50% of the adult population sleep in an open mouth. Oh, wow. That's not good. They're breathing fast, right. they're breathing upper chest, they're more, ups, more prone to obstructive sleep apnea, snoring, etc. And that in turn then is going to impact their everyday breathing as well. Hmm. Well, and it, it what came through in the book too is that the bolt score is really critical because it becomes kind of a good measuring stick. And maybe we can talk uh, later in the episode about you know some of the, the various approaches and methods you can use to increase breath hold, increase um, I don't know the, the the efficiency of your breathing. Sure. Um, but it seems like that's like the measuring stick that that you provide a lot of times to say like, hey, look, if your bolt score isn't to here. Yes. Like it might not be safe for you to attempt this, you know, by yourself yes. without supervision. So, um, the, the bolt score was really interesting to me and I had uh, a lot of fun trying that. And I still don't know if I have an accurate bolt score. I'm gonna have to sure. sit down now, like you said, and, and resume normal breathing and then give it a shot. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned the, the complications that come with open mouth breathing. Yes. You know, I, 
I would say, and it's so funny because breathing is just such an innate part of what we do every minute of every day that most people don't know what does correct breathing even look like. Um, maybe, maybe to take a step back, right? What is the right way to breathe? Just how we, our ancestors breathed it, just how we should have, be, how we would have been breathing throughout evolution. Um, breathing pattern disorders are very much more modern. Mouth breathing mm. is modern. Our ancestors, even distant cousins Neanderthals weren't mouth breathers. They were nasal breathers. We know this by the shape of the face, that when the mouth is closed, right. the, the tongue is resting in the roof of the mouth. It's the, it's the pressure is exerted by the tongue as it rests in the roof of the mouth, which helps to develop the maxilla, which is the top jaw and also the lower jaw. So the fifth, the fifth, the lower 50% of the face is influenced. The growth of that is influenced by how you breathe as a child. So, which I thought was fascinating when I read that. Yes, I, yeah. I, I immediately ran down and I was like, listen, our kids need to start breathing through their nose if they're not right now. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely, it's absolutely vital, Ken. And you know what? Despite this being known since 1909, and this had been written mm. about in one journal at the time, Dental Cosmos, that children who are mouth breathing, they have crooked teeth. So crooked teeth is yeah. caused by poor breathing patterns. Um, they are likely to be more prone to ADHD. Mm. A study by Karen Bonnock in 2012 published in the journal Pediatrics looking at 11,000 children. If sleep disorder breathing, which mouth breathing contributes to it, if these children have sleep disorder breathing, by age five, if it's untreated, they have a 40% increased risk of special education needs by age eight. So wow. from a cognitive development, but also for the development of the face and the airways, nasal breathing is essential. We as human beings, we're the only species that persistently mouth breathe. A dog hmm. will have its mouth open for a period of time to regulate body temperature. And if we look at the anatomic, the anatomy of the nose versus the mouth, and here's a simple yeah. anatomical model. Okay. If we look, say for instance, here's the front profile here. You see the nose and you see the lips and you see the jaw, the chin here. Yeah. So here we have an open mouth. If we ask, what does the mouth do in terms of breathing? Well, if air is inhaled in through that mouth, does the mouth perform any functions in terms of breathing? And the answer is no. The, hmm. the mouth does absolutely nothing. Now, if we look at the extent of the nasal cavity, most people think their nose is what they see in the face. This is the nose, yeah. but that's only about 25%. The nasal cavity is going well back within the skull and it's the nose that's connected with the diaphragm. Oh, wow. The nose is also connected with the brain. By breathing through your nose, it's known that the pressure of oxygen in the blood increases by 10%. That's been known since 1988. <laughs> nasal breathing during physical exercise is better recovery, but not only better recovery, if you go for a run with your mouth closed, you'll have higher carbon dioxide in the blood. You know this by the feeling of air hunger. And carbon dioxide, as it increases in the blood, will open up blood vessels, but mm. also cause more oxygen to be released from the hemoglobin to tissues and organs. So you're wow. more likely to stay aerobically for longer, breathing through your nose versus the mouth. Nose breathing is holding on to moisture in the human body. Nose breathing is protecting the airways. Nose breathing is activating the diaphragm with greater amplitude and functional movement using the diaphragm generates intra-abdominal pressure, which mm. in turn is providing stabilization, postural control. So it's related to functional movement. And yeah. if you were to look at, say, the functional movement screen or any screen which is looking at movement, you will see that the predominant people who pass that screen are diaphragmatic breathers and functional breathers. Hmm. And the nose is the critical component to that. So I suppose, you know, it's really just the depth of where we go with breathing. It's yeah. not just about like if you go to, say, your yoga studio, which is excellent doing yoga, and the yoga instructor is focusing on the biomechanics of breathing. Typically, the yoga instructor is not looking at the biochemistry of breathing, nor are they looking at resonance frequency breathing. Hmm. I, my background originally was all about the biochemistry. And I wasn't looking at the biomechanics and I wasn't looking at resonance frequency breathing. And then somebody who's in interest with heart rate variability, they're focusing as on resonance frequency breathing and they're not less necessarily looking at the biomechanics and the biochemistry. Oh. And what I wanted to do with at least the oxygen advantage, because the oxygen advantage, there is no tradition to it. And there's no, this is the way you need to do it. No, it's wide open. 
Yeah. And having that ability of a wide open approach gave me a freedom and a freedom to choose different exercises and different techniques and bring in our own as well, our own influence, of course, our own exercises and target breathing from all three dimensions. And that's looking at functional breathing patterns that we cannot just think of breathing from being breathe low using the diaphragm. And, you know, you should never hear anybody breathe inside a yoga studio because if the emphasis is on diaphragmatic breathing and breathing low, it doesn't make sense to sacrifice the biochemistry in the process because mm. how hard you breathe. And, you know, there is an idea out there that if you start taking full and big breaths that you increase oxygen delivery to tissues and organs, and the, yeah. the, it's the converse that's true, you know? If we want, which, is, which I, I found really interesting because yes. I, uh, you know, I thought I was doing the right thing by taking like those deeper, like you said, uh, I guess the words diaphragmatic breaths. Um, and then when I when I read in the book, like uh, it's actually the better approach is is quite the opposite. I was like, oh damn it! Well, look, see, see, you know, <laughs> it, it is. We do want to breathe using the diaphragm. There's no question yeah. of that. But the question is. Do we need to be taking these big breaths in order to engage the diaphragm? And the answer is no, ah. because in the process, I think a lot of people make the mistake that, you know, in the belief of activating the diaphragm that we need to fill our lungs full of air. No, that's not necessarily true. Our blood is already almost fully saturated, 95 to 99% saturated with oxygen with hmm. normal breathing. And if okay. we breathe more air, we're not going to increase oxygen saturation. And if we do, we're not going to increase it by a whole lot. But say, for example, if I was to, if we were to look at people with dysfunctional breathing, breathing a little bit right. faster, a little bit upper chest, mouth breathing, irregular breathing, a bold score of less than 25 seconds. It's very common for these people to have cold hands and feet. Oh boy. And this will suggest as well, of course, that now it's normal. And the reason being is because blood vessels constrict due to the volume of air that we breathe if we are breathing in excess of what we need. So mm. I often say to students, you know, listen, what happens when you start for periods of time breathing a little bit less air? And I say to them, breathe in and out through your nose and really slow down the speed of the air coming into your nose and then have a really relaxed and a slow, gentle breath out. And then take a very soft breath in through your nose and a really relaxed and a slow, gentle breath out and breathe 30% less air into your body simply mm. by slowing down the speed of the air as it comes into the nose and as it leaves the nose. Yeah. And if you're doing it correctly, you feel air hunger. And if you do that for a few minutes, you start to notice increased watery saliva in the mouth. You start mm. to feel drowsy, but your hands start to become warmer. So, mm. you know, breathing a little bit less air for periods of time is exposing the body to higher carbon dioxide. And one theory is that it's reducing the chemo sensitivity of the body to carbon dioxide. But it is changing breathing patterns so that breathing becomes slower. Mm. And if we practice breathing lighter during the day, we do influence our breathing during sleep. Now, I can imagine that, you know, snoring is very common. Obstructive yeah. sleep apnea in men is very common. Mm -hmm. It's 25% of men up to the age of 50 years of age and 43% of men from 50 to 70 years of age. It's a lot. I was just, just talking about it with a, with a family member unrelated to this yes. podcast yesterday. I yeah. mean, it, it was, hey, we got to figure this out. Like, I think it's a real problem. Like, we're going to go see a doctor. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's incredibly common. Yeah. Well, breathing has a huge role to play there. I've just written an article, a review article with an ear, nose and throat doctor, Dr. Carlos O'Connor from, from Madrid and Dr. Guillermo. And we've submitted it for publication to a scientific journal. We're going through the review process. When you breathe through your nose with your tongue resting in the roof of the mouth, you have to open up the airway. You're opening up the architecture of the upper airway so the airway is less likely to collapse. When you mm. breathe through the nose, you're engaging the diaphragm. When you're engaging the diaphragm breathing muscle more, it increases lung volume, which causes the throat to be stiffer and less likely to collapse. We have to think that the throat is like a, a collapsible paper tube. Okay. And if you breathe hard through it, the negative pressure as you're taking air into your lungs is causing the airway to collapse. Now, ah. even simple snoring, 
So I, you know, the students, I'll always use this example, make the sound of a snore through the mouth and they go like this. Mm-hmm. And then I say, close your mouth and try and snore through your mouth. You can't. Mm-hmm. So mouth snoring stops once you get the mouth closed. Yeah. And then I say, try and snore through your nose and it goes like this. <sighs> and now mm-hmm. I say, Gently slow down the speed of the air coming into your nose and then have a really relaxed and a slow, gentle breath out. And as you're breathing really slowly, try and snore through your nose. And you'll find that it's a lot more difficult to snore through your nose when your breathing is slow. I was just trying to do it. And uh, yes. as everyone knows, I'm, I'm mic'd up. <laughs> and I, couldn't, yes. I couldn't get it to happen. So here, the interesting thing here is that doctors in the main are looking at the airway, but they're not looking at flow. And no engineer would look at the diameter of a vessel without considering the flow that's going through it. Now, hmm. if we look at breathing pattern disorders in the population, 75% of people with anxiety have breathing pattern disorders. 75%. Wow. This group of people is going to, you know, it crosses all domains. So if we, th- if we think of the human airway, and we have to consider the airway as being the space at the back of the nose and where the, the mouth meets the throat as well. So that where the back of the nose meets the throat and where the mouth meets the throat and then the throat itself. Mm-hmm. A good airway is the size of our thumb. Okay. And a poor airway is the size of a pen a big biro, Mm -hmm. for example, and we don't have much room for air there. And if the mouth is open and the jaws are set back, and if the individual is breathing hard, it's increasing pressure inside the airway, which increases the risk of snoring and collapse. Mm -hmm. Now, if we look then at different populations with breathing pattern disorders, including, say, for example, people with anxiety, I can only think of the number of people with anxiety, people with high stress levels, people with depression. And they are doing cognitive behavioral therapy, which is wonderful. But mm-hmm. CBT does not change respiratory physiology. And yeah. nor does sleep be impacted. And anybody mm. coming in with agitation of the mind, how can you get a clean, a clear, calm mind unless we improve breathing patterns and also unless we improve sleep? Right. So if we think of breathing and sleep and the emotions... If the mind is racing, it's going to impact our sleep because you cannot fall asleep so readily when the mind is racing. If if we're stressed out, it impacts our breathing because we breathe faster and harder. But if we breathe harder and faster, it in turn is going to affect the mind. So the emotions feed our breathing. How we breathe is feeding the mind. Yeah. Our mind is feeding our sleep. And if we have poor quality sleep, it feeds the emotions. Our breathing, if we're breathing cycle. hard and fast, it also feeds into to sleep. All three is interconnected. Yeah. And, you know, you can tie in here with heart rate variability okay. as a measurement of resilience and recovery. You know, for the human being, traditionally, a medical doctor has no way of measuring the impact that the stress has on that individual. Whether it's a psychological stress or a physical stress or environmental stress, doctor, you know, you go to your doctor and you say, doctor, I'm feeling really stressed out. And the doctor is only going by a subjective kind of evaluation that the person has. Mm-hmm. Measuring heart rate variability would provide the doctor with the tools to determine the impact the stress is having on that person. And heart rate variability refers to that as human beings, the timing between our heartbeats should be variable. It shouldn't be the same. Okay. And therapists of old would typically have realized that on inhalation, the heartbeat should be getting faster. So the timing between heartbeats should be shorter. And on exhalation, the heart rate should be getting slower and the timing between heartbeats should be longer. So Mm. it's very easy to look at and feel, you know, if you have your students and they locate their pulse and then they sync, synchronize the timing of their, 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 how fast our heartbeat is relative to their breathing, what that's called is respiratory sinus arrhythmia. Mm. If we're in good balance, that the autonomic nervous system is in good balance between the parasympathetic rest and digest versus the sympathetic fight and flight. Yeah. That in turn will in- indicate 
good heart rate variability and vice versa. Hmm. So individuals who are not well, physically unwell, emotionally unwell, typically have reduced heart rate variability. And by changing our breathing patterns on a number of fronts, one is nose breathing during sleep improves heart rate variability. Number two is the breathe light exercises whereby we deliberately breathe less air for periods of time to expose the body to a feeling of air hunger. That in turn increases heart rate variability. Number hmm. three, breathing low using the diaphragm increases heart rate variability. Number four, hmm. Breathing slow to a cadence of between 4.5 and 6.5 breaths per minute increases heart rate variability. And oh, heart, wow. heart rate variability is as an objective and clinical measure of vagal tone. And you can tie in that with that so many different things because inflammation, for example, when inflammation is present in the body, it impacts heart rate variability. But if we can stimulate the vagus nerve, we can reduce inflammation. And we can do mm -hmm. that by virtue of the breath, that by slowing down breathing, by nose breathing, by breathing light, by breathing low and bringing it into our everyday life. We in turn then have the ability to help counteract the effect of stress, but also to recover quicker. Hmm. So and here again, and I'll just mention it before I forget, Ken, so many yeah. people over the years have come in with depression um, and you, you start talking to them and you just ask, like, how do you feel when you wake up in the morning? And they'll tell you that they wake up feeling exhausted. And then I'll ask, well, has any, anybody asked you about the quality of your sleep? And they say no, typically. Hmm. Because the healthcare professional is often thinking that it's the depression which is causing exhaustion. The person is exhausted because of their depression. But right. maybe we should be asking the question, this person could have obstructive sleep apnea. This person could have a combination of insomnia and obstructive sleep apnea, which in turn leads to depression. So yeah. here we have to look at the human body, that we cannot just look at one function in isolation without looking at the bi-directional relationships that different functions have. Yeah. Breathing, the emotions and sleep are three functions that we can look at very nicely. And I will say this, you do not have focus or concentration or the ability to handle stress unless you can tap into breathing and sleep and the emotions. And for me, it changed wow. my life 20 years ago. You know, my ability to focus and concentrate. Yeah. Well, so evolutionarily, right? Like you said, if an engineer took a view at the human body, yes. right? It, it would be very clear the way in which things are supposed to operate. Like what has kind of happened in recent modern history that has led to people to have this dysfunctional breathing? Like maybe we even just start like, why, why are people mouth breathing? I think there's so many different reasons for it. And it's probably mm. difficult enough to pinpoint it. Sure. If you were to look at young infants, um, for example, midwives in 16th century France, they had an extra long fingernail. If the baby was tongue tied, they, they would just clip it, clip the tie in order to allow oh, wow. the baby to raise their tongue from the roof of the mouth so that the baby could feed from the mother because breastfeeding mm. is not just about nutrition, but it's about development of the muscles of the face necessary for craniofacial growth. So oh, wow. society has made sure that both couples are up to their debt in mortgages, that both the husband and the wife have to work or both partners have to work. And the mother, of mm -hmm. course, then because of, you know, bills, etc. So society is, has played a role in this. Look at yeah. the food that we eat. Um, you go to your local supermarket and look what you see in the shelves. Our ancestors ate hard food. They ate food that you had to chew. Nowadays, hmm. the food comes pre-chewed in most instances. Um, <laughs> I love that. Our, our stress levels. You know, oh, yeah. you can think about our ancestors and they had a lot of quiet time. They had a lot of time for reflection. Yes, they had time for, you know, they, there was a time to hunt and to gather. And of course, there were, there were different threats at the time as well. But it wasn't that chronic, that chronic stress, that mm. chronic stress of getting fired, working in a company that you absolutely hate, working for a boss that's an idiot. You know, all of this pressures and the consumer pressures advertising look at COVID at the moment i've yeah. switched off radios i've turned off t tvs all of the news all of the mainstream media 
because all I'm hearing at the moment, and I'm sometimes feeling like it doesn't bother me, to be honest with you, um, but I'm just feeling for the people who are out there that are listening to every single news bulletin, that are engrossed in this, and all they're hearing is over and over and over and over and over, COVID, 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 COVID. Just How constant, constant How, reminder. Exactly. Crazy stuff. We have to be selective with the amount of information that, you know, that we are letting in. And it's a tr- the another aspect even in terms of breathing is, of course, stress is a factor. Lack mm-hmm. of exercise. Talking is not good for breathing. And any of your listeners who talk for a living, they'll know that they'll be pretty tired at the end of the day's talking, not just because of the degree of concentration, but because of the impact that talking has on breathing, because talking makes us breathe hmm. harder and faster, which in turn is going to reduce blood flow and oxygen delivery to the brain. So it's so interesting you say that. I, I, I you know, when I'm not doing my podcasts, I, I'm in sales and yes. there will be some days where I'll have, you know, if it's a really busy day, I might go three hours having back to back hour meetings and where, you know, if I'm introducing whatever we do to the client, not, you know, yes, well, my, my sales leader should be like, you should probably be doing more listening than just talking. But <laughs> I'm doing a lot of talking over that time. And yeah, I mean, when I walk away from that, I you kind of sit down. I'm like, man, yeah, I, yeah. I am wiped. Yes. And I always attribute it to, well, I was just mentally engaged yeah. for three hours. You know, I was just so focused that it's just mentally draining. I never considered the fact that by talking for that amount of extended time, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, that I was actually maybe like robbing myself quite literally of oxygen. Yeah, pretty much. (laughs) That's what's happening. And, and you know what, some people will cope with it better than others, depending on genetics and depending on their breathing patterns. Um, Because there is a genetic influence as well. And then if you look at people with different conditions, the anxiety population, you know, all those people who are going to psychotherapy and psychiatry and all of these different things, who's looking at their functional breathing? I work with people with anxiety. Typically, they breathe a little bit faster and a little bit upper chest breathing. And as long as they breathe that way, it's feeding into their conditions. People with asthma, Mm. they have inflammation of the lungs. It travels up to their nose. Their nose is stuffy. They're not just having problems with their airways. They have problems with the nose, but they have problems with sleep. Because if Mm. you have a stuffy nose, you're twice as likely to have sleep problems. No, so, yeah. so, you know, it, as human beings, we're so complex. And this is the thing about breathing. Breathing is simple, and yet it's not so simple. Hmm. Well, and, and here's another really common question uh, that, that often I know I've had, uh, I, I've received from people in the past, uh, just based on some of the conversations we've had on the show. You know, uh, we've talked about the importance of engaging the diaphragm. Yes. Um, I think a lot of people are a little surprised to hear that we need to pay so much attention to making sure that we're activating that diaphragm because a lot of people I think have the experience and I, I count myself in that group when I think back uh you know I, I was an athlete as well um and I remember vividly the sensation of like the upper chest breathing you know uh whether it was before a big game or after like a lot of exertion like upper chest breathing it is can, can you describe a little bit like maybe um a how we should be breathing but but maybe even more importantly, like what are some things that people listening can pay attention to? So as they start to try and work on their breathing, maybe even while they're listening um, or just throughout the course of their day, like what are the things that they should be looking for uh, to understand if, if they're breathing correctly? Well, breathing should never be an effort. So breathing <laughs> should be effortless. Yeah. So if the individual feels that they're not getting enough air or if they're feeling that they're sighing quite a bit, or for okay. example, if they feel that their breathing is faster or if they're waking up with a dry mouth in the morning or even going for light physical exercise with the mouth open. Yeah. So in terms of breathing during rest and also during light physical exercise, the, the chest movement should be relatively still, maybe about 20% overall. And primarily we should have about 80% of the movement driven by the diaphragm. So the diaphragm is the, is the muscle that's separating our chest from the abdomen. Hmm. And it's shaped like the dome of an umbrella and it's quite thin and it's quite strong. And I suppose the best way to think of it would be like a sheet of leather. It's okay. thin and it's strong. Yeah. Now, when, when the brain sends a message, so basically the brain is monitoring carbon dioxide in the blood and blood pH. When carbon dioxide increases a small amount, it's very sensitive. The brain is very sensitive to changes in carbon dioxide and result in blood pH. The brain sends a message to the diaphragm. The diaphragm breathing muscle moves downwards during rest by about two to three centimeters. 
With mm. that, we have movement of lateral expansion. So we have movement of the sides. So we, our lower ribs should gently move outwards. We should have some mm. movement to the front yeah. and we should have some movement to the back. So we should mm. be thinking of the core as a box. You've got the pelvic floor, you've got the diaphragm, you've got the abs, you've got the spinal muscles. Okay. And it's the diaphragm breathing muscle that is absolutely essential for massaging the internal organs. The diaphragm breathing muscle is connected with the emotions. The diaphragm breathing muscle is providing stabilization for the spine. The diaphragm breathing muscle is generating what's called intra-abdominal pressure. And mm. functional breathing and the generation of intra-abdominal pressure, and a good gauge for this is, Simply have your hands either side of your lower ribs. Yeah. And as you breathe in, you should feel that your lower ribs are moving out. Mm. And as you breathe out, you should feel that your lower ribs are moving in. Now do the same with mouth breathing. So if you look down at your chest and breathe yeah. through an open mouth, so you'll see that mouth breathing is typically activating the upper chest. Yeah. And nose breathing is more likely to breathe low. Now, in terms of breathing efficiency, Every breath that we take, one, the last 150 milliliters of that air doesn't reach the small air sacs in the lungs for gas exchange to take place. Hmm. And if we're breathing fast and shallow, we're taking more air into the upper regions of the lungs, but the greatest concentration of blood flow is in the lower regions of the lungs. Uh -huh. By breathing through the nose, we're taking the air into the lower regions of the lungs. But also by breathing through the nose, we pick up a gas called nitric oxide. And yeah, I wanted to ask you about this as well. Nitric oxide helps to redistribute the blood throughout the lungs so that gas exchange improves. So hmm. go for a run with your mouth closed. Yes, at the start you feel more air hunger. You'll feel suffocated mm -hmm. because you're breathing through a smaller, a smaller entry to the airways than the mouth. However, yeah. if you continue doing your run with your mouth closed, the air hunger diminishes over time. And the body adapts to this. And the body adapts in a number of positive ways. Number one is that the chemo sensitivity to carbon dioxide reduces. So air hunger reduces. Number two, carbon dioxide in the blood increases during exercise. Number three, the fraction of expired oxygen is going to be less. In other words, the, mm. the oxygen that you're taking into your body, your body is going to use it. So you're not yeah. breathing it back out again. Number four, you're protecting the upper and lower ah, airways. And number five, you're activating the diaphragm. Number six, you're not going to tire so quickly. And number seven, when you breathe through the nose, it's adding a pressure and it's adding a resistance to your breathing. So it's helping to strengthen the diaphragm breathing muscle. And mm. having improved respiratory muscle strength is very important because up to 50% of athletes, they have respiratory, they can have respiratory muscle fatigue. And when the breathing muscles fatigue, blood is stolen from the legs to feed the diaphragm. So if you've seen an athlete, and mm. the athlete is at full flight. And the next thing is you see the legs going from under them. Yeah. Why is that happening? Is that due to a buildup of hydrogen ion? Is it a buildup? Or is it, for example, that the respiratory muscles have fatigued? And the, we always have to think of this. The oh, wow. function of breathing is more important than many other functions. And other functions are going to sac be sacrificed to maintain our breathing, our respiration. Hmm. Man, so that, that, that's so interesting. And, and uh, I know um, a lot of the things that we've talked about today are just, um, you know, beneficial for everyday life, functioning as a human being yes. uh, and hopefully close to your potential. Um, and I know that you do a lot of work as well, helping people eke out what could, I suppose, be like a marginal gain yes. or making, making big enhancements in the way that their body is able to process oxygen so that they can perform at a, at a much higher level. And uh, one of the things that I really enjoyed reading about was simulating altitude training. Yes, yes. Can, can we talk a little bit about uh, the ways in which you leverage altitude training? And I suppose you, you leverage it with the general population as well, but with athletes specifically uh, yeah. to help them improve performance? Yes, we, we do breath holding, a lot of breath holds. And we typically do breath holds, but most of the... And maybe, and maybe that's a good question too. Maybe I, I can even ask you to define, because people are like, oh, altitude training, we, we go up to the mountains. And could, yes. could, could you even maybe start by defining what uh, altitude training is in, in the terms of the way in which you use it? Sure. So say, for example, if you're going into the mountains, 
um, yeah. you still have 21% of the concentration of, of atmospheric air as oxygen. But the, the issue is that the higher you go up, atmospheric pressure decreases. And yeah. as a result, then you, you're, the amount of oxygen in your blood is going to be reduced. And you're, if you're in the mountains, you're exposing your body to reduced oxygen for a period of time to force the body to make adaptations. Now, mm -hmm. a lot of the time, going to the mountain is not going to be accessible for people. So we do breath holding, and it's intermittent hypoxic hypercapnic training. And all that means is that we're doing breath holding for short periods of time to lower blood oxygen saturation, but to also increase carbon dioxide. And it's the combination of the drop to blood oxygen saturation and the increase to carbon dioxide, which in turn disturbs the blood acid base balance. But hmm. we're forcing the body into a state of acidosis that the body then is making adaptations to increase what's called buffering capacity. And okay. the buffering capacity is where by we can, for example, by increasing buffering capacity, we can delay lactic acid and fatigue. So that would be uh -huh. just one aspect of it. So the exercise is fairly simple. Don't do this if yeah. you're pregnant. Don't do it if you have serious medical conditions. But you could be at home. You could be even just listening, standing in the spot. Take a normal yeah. breath in and out through your nose and pinch your nose with your fingers and start walking. And then go into a jog and go into a run and you're continuously holding your breath as you're moving. Yeah. And keep going until you have a fairly strong air hunger. Then let go, but minimal breathing. Minimal breathing for six breaths. And mm. then back to normal breathing for 12 to 18 breaths. And during that time, if you are wearing pulse oximeter, I don't have one close to hand, but basically it's a little finger probe that oh, measures yeah. your blood oxygen saturation. And it gives you real-time feedback on the saturation, exactly. right? Exactly. And typically yeah, you'll see yeah. your blood oxygen saturation going from 98% back down to, say, 85%. Okay. And this way, because if you think of... People do high-intensity interval training mm -hmm. to stimulate anaerobic glycolysis. And it's all very well, but it's traumatic for the athlete. And a lot of athletes actually mm. get injured during the training by training too hard. Now, if you do high-intensity interval training, breathing through an open mouth, your blood oxygen saturation drops from about 98% down to 93%. Your if you do it mouth breathing. If you do it mouth breathing. Your carbon dioxide in the blood is going to be the same. It's not going to change okay. in around 40 okay. millimeters of mercury. Okay. If you do high-intensity interval training with your mouth closed... Your blood oxygen saturation will drop from 98% down to about 91% or 90%. Mm. Mild hypoxia. Carbon dioxide in the blood will increase from about 40 millimeters of mercury, probably to about 44, 45. So it's slightly hypercapnic. Now, if we do breath holding, even if we just did it jogging, we're dropping the blood oxygen saturation from 98% down into the mid 80s or even into the low 80s, even into the 70s. We're increasing carbon dioxide from 40 up to 50 plus. So in terms of the changes of blood gases, doing breath holding has a much stronger response in terms of dropping blood oxygen saturation, increasing carbon dioxide, disturbing the blood acid base balance, but it's less trauma. And not only that, but you're also putting a load onto the breathing muscles. It helps mm. open up the nose. So you'll feel that your nose will decongest. Anytime your nose is stuffy, simply breathe in and out through your nose, pinch your nose and start walking around holding your breath. And then let go and breathe in through your nose. Do it a few times and your nose will open up. For people so with for asthma. Whatever, and, and for whatever reason, like yes. I, I think it might be time of year here. And, uh, you know, I do have allergies. But that, that was one thing that I found to be really interesting in the book is that these practices are not only beneficial for enhancing performance, right? Or, or to your point, increasing that buffer capability. Yes. Uh, but it's like, it can actually help alleviate a lot of these, I, I guess symptom is the right word, these symptoms mm. that we experience uh, that often we, the first thing we do, myself included, is I, I run to the nasal spray. I grab mm. a decongestant, I go to an antihistamine. Yes. Uh, I, I personally haven't tried it yet, but that's one of those things uh, that's kind of come out of the way of exposure to your work that I'm like, oh wow, I, I need to try this. Cause I would love to rely on something that's natural and inherent versus something that, you know, is yeah. a synth synthetic compound that just kind of patches up the symptom for a short amount of time. Yes, and it's been known since 1923 that if you hold your breath, oh, you open what? up the nose. People would ask me, what? 
Why is it significant? Well, the thing about why is it happening in terms of Brett tolling? It's not exactly sure, but there were a Hmm. few papers that were published 30 years ago and it focused on Brett tolling, increasing carbon dioxide in the blood because as you hold your breath, carbon dioxide cannot leave the blood through the lungs. So carbon dioxide is going to increase in in the lungs. It's going to increase in the blood. And it's taught that it's the increase to carbon dioxide which causes the the nose to become more free. And the other thing that I'd say, Ken, is that anybody with hay fever or any nasally related symptoms. Oh, man. You are barking up the right tree here. It's their sleep. Sleep is impacted. (sighs) You You know, you have an athlete with hay fever. And that athlete then doesn't realize the connection between, yeah, their nose is stuffy. So what what are they doing? Their mouth breathing and the nasal congestion yeah. and mouth breathing is going to impact their sleep. Taping the mouth was one thing that I started doing 20 years ago, and it absolutely changed my ability to focus. I was waking up for years feeling groggy and unrefreshed. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, we're supposed to go into school. We're supposed to go into university. We're supposed to be able to go in there and concentrate how can you perform unless you wake up feeling refreshed? And I yeah. guarantee you, 50% of the people listening to this, they wake up with a dry mouth in the morning. They're waking mm-hmm. up feeling groggy. They're, they may have snoring, obstructive sleep apnea. Their attention spans and their energy levels are dipping in the afternoon. They are not performing at their best. And this is regardless of age. I was 16 and 17 and I was exhausted, falling asleep. You know, and... This is unfair for kids because you have children with sleep disorder breathing that's undiagnosed because despite the knowledge, 25 to 50 percent of studied children persistently mouth breathe. Many of these Mm. kids have have sleep issues. These kids are told, go into school, concentrate and get good grades. These kids are not going to achieve or excel to the best of their ability. And it's not because these kids are stupid. These kids can be highly intelligent, but the problem is their sleep. If they mm. don't have good sleep, they're not going to excel academically. Yeah, it's like they're they're waking up and having to run underwater. They're just like they're just not starting yes. anywhere near their potential for the day. Totally. And the adults are the same. You know, mm. and that's the interesting thing. And you know, the taping of the mountain, there's a number, I'll show you a couple of different options. Um the one that I started off using tape was yeah, this please. one here. 3M one inch micropore tape. You, okay. you pick it up in any drugstore and you just tear off, say, about, um, sometimes it's tricky enough to get where it is, about 10 centimeters or about six inches or so. Okay. And so just bear me one second. I'm just ripping it off here. And by the way, your nose will never completely congest when your mouth is closed. As long as you breathe through your nose, your nose will stay fairly, it'll stay open. It might feel a little mm. bit uncomfortable, but it will never completely close. So the tape is, I just fold a tab either side, put yeah. my lips. Hmm. Got it. Now, the other my t- wife, I can't, I cannot wait to run this one by my <laughs> wife. This is <laughs> delighted. Uh, She's going to be like, is that what you're into? I'm like, no, no, you're not listening to me. It's, <laughs> it's for the nose breathing. <laughs> but the other one that we brought out, we brought out a tape called Myo tape and we brought it out specifically for children, teenagers, and adults who were a little bit apprehensive about taping. And I'll just show you this one. Yeah, please. This is a kind of a camouflage. Um, so oh, this, is, cool. well, this is the Mayo tape here. Now, okay. this is just a test color. We haven't brought out the camouflage yet, but this is, I'm just going to show you just to get an idea. Yeah, please. So it's, it's a tape that we gently stretch it. Okay. And you stretch it and it surrounds the mat. Oh. And it brings the lips together. So, oh, so that so your your mouth actually isn't covered, but it, it provides enough kind of I don't know compression. And, yes. And it, oh and wow! So it activates a muscle called the orbicularis oris muscle because it's bidirectional tension. So it helps to activate the muscles to help ensure nasal breathing. We did it obviously for hmm. kids, and the reason we call it myo tape is because of the dentistry and myofunctional therapy. Children oh, who wow. are mouth breathing. All mouth breathing children develop crooked teeth. And wow. even when you embark on orthodontic route, if the child continues mouth breathing, the teeth are going to relapse. There's a 65 to 75% relapse of the teeth falling back in again because it's the tongue 
in the roof of the mouth, which helps to develop and keep the, the teeth ah, stable. So it's the proper placement of the tongue and yes. keeping every that. that oh, wow. Yeah. Is, is, that, is that tape available? I, I know the color is not, but uh, is yeah. the Mayo the myofascial it's that same with like the, the gap in the middle because i yes. imagine there's a lot of people who are like look this is really important to me but i don't know if i'm ready to take the step of taping my kid's mouth shut but yes. that i feel like uh you would feel much more confident because if you know they, they have the ability to open the lips if needed but it's yeah. like creating that reinforcement uh for like proper breathing patterns yeah the myo i'm gonna have to put, it, it, gonna have to it, put it in order as a, soon as it's available off and uh all of the children's programs are free online so if you just oh, go to cool. YouTube and just put in Patrick McKeown and children's breathing exercise. So there's, there's exercise for kids to decongest their nose um, and okay. the importance of nasal breathing for children, helping children to switch from mouth to nose breathing, correct tongue yeah. resting posture, the steps exercise. So it's all there because I think, you know, we really need to get this information. This information has been overlooked by mm -hmm. two industries, the dental industry and the medical industry. It shouldn't have been overlooked. Yeah. And there have been wonderful doctors and wonderful dentists who have really put it out there of the importance of nose breathing. But the thing about this is that teaching a child to breathe through the nose is not going to generate money. It's, you know, there's no return on it. And I think that's mm -hmm. why it has been overlooked. It's so simple. It. And yet these kids, you know, there was a study conducted, published in the American Journal of Orthodontics back in 1981. A Canadian doctor based in the United States called Harvold, H-A-R-V-O-L-D. He noticed that the patients coming into him, the children who were mouth breathing, had more crooked teeth, but not only were, were their teeth overcrowded, their jaws were set back. They had craniofacial abnormalities. Their nose was looking bigger. The maxilla was set back. The mandible was set back. Their airways compromised. And he said, let's hmm. do an experiment. He got young rhesus monkeys, six months old, and he blocked their noses with silicon nose plugs. And okay. he forced the monkeys to breathe through an open mouth. All of the experimental animals developed craniofacial abnormalities similar to human beings. Now, I wow. say that, you know, sometimes that comes up in conversation and people are saying, oh, my God, he surgically blocked the noses of the monkeys. He did. How terrible. But right. yeah. think about the thousands and millions of children who are going around with their mouths hanging open. They, too, are partaking in this experiment and nobody's telling these kids, breathe through your mm -hmm. nose. It's really and I was one of those kids. And there are so many children out there the same, you know, so oh, yeah. I suppose. It's not just for the ch children, but it's for adults as well. But let's get it out there, you know? Absolutely. Well, and it's to your point, you know, like I, if I just think about myself, uh, I was an athlete, still am an athlete, you know, and people yes. always correct me on that. Um, but, you know, I'm also a very curious person. I'm always looking for like some, some way to get better, some way to improve. Yeah. Uh, and this is not something that I've stumbled upon. And in fact, some people who I've gotten advice from in the past, uh, you know, based off this conversation, I got bad advice. Um, so yeah, there, it's not common knowledge. And to me, it is yeah, silly, right? That like, we don't, for whatever reason, we have all these dysfunctional breathing patterns, and it should be something that just comes so naturally to us. Uh, but I think to your point, there is a need to like educate. Yes. And, and and I think what's exciting, uh, and I've, I'm finding myself doing it while recording this podcast, you know, it's something that I've been working on as we're talking. Um, and actually just yesterday I, I did my first cardio workout breathing only through my nose. And you're right. At first it did feel mm. a bit more difficult or uncomfortable, but I was actually surprised by how long and the amount of effort I was able actually to exert while breathing just through my nose that made me feel like, Oh wow. If I, if I committed to this, I really think I could get to a point where I could just continue to, to breathe in that way versus always feeling the need, you know, when I'm really exerting myself to get in the yes. big gust of air. And, and maybe that's a good question for you too. And I, I know we're probably running out of time here. Is there ever a scenario where it does make sense to mouth breathe? Mouth, yes. Sorry, mouth, mouth, mouth breathe? Yeah, yeah, you can once the intensity of physical exercise gets too high. But, mm -hmm. you know, switch to mouth breathing. You could go, for example, intra nose and outro nose and continue nasal breathing for as much as you can. And yeah. then if the intensity is getting a bit too high, 
breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth so you get rid of carbon dioxide easier so that alleviates okay. your hunger and then if it gets too high again switch mouth to mouth but if we look at one professor of sports medicine dr george dalham from the united states he okay. is a triathlete um international or national triathlete but also works with olympic athletes and mm. he's intrigued with nasal breathing and has done some studies at it one recent one it was a couple of years old now he got 10 recreational athletes and he said i want to test you guys how do you perform breathing through your nose but he said in order to do that i need you to breathe exclusively through your nose for six months because what mm. he wanted to do was to see what adaptations take place if I just grab an athlete and I say to this person, I want you now to breathe through your nose, their performance is going to dip because I'm adding mm -hmm. an extra load onto them. Right. But if I say to that athlete, keep breathing through your nose during all of your physical exercise, or at least even 50% of your physical exercise, during your warm up, during your low intensity, get your mouth closed at night, keep breathing through your nose and having the idea of light, slow and deep. Light mm, is about the excellent. biochemistry. Slow is about don't breathe fast and shallow because it's very inefficient. Deep is about breathing low. So LSD, I'm sure you, you, you know, many of your listeners will remember that one. So mm -hmm. in terms of light, slow and deep, Dalham got 10 recreational athletes, had them breathe exclusively through their nose for six months. Then he tested them and they had 22% less ventilation with nasal breathing versus mouth breathing. So you can imagine going for a run. Now, this was doing high intensity. This was a graded exercise test, pretty okay. much high intensity training. And they were able to perform with nasal breathing to achieve the same intensity, 100% of a work rate with nasal breathing versus mouth breathing, but with 22% less ventilation. Now, there's a question there we have to think of it in terms of economy, especially with endurance athletes. 22% yeah. less ventilation because there is an energy cost associated with breathing. As right. we speak here, about 2 to 3% of our VO2 is going to support the breathing muscles. If you do kind of light exercise, it's about 6%. If you do high intensity exercise, it's about 10%. If you do maximum exercise, it could be as high as 15%. But if hmm. you have dysfunctional breathing patterns, it's going to increase it even further. Hmm. So it's all about making, you know, what can we do with a given amount of air? And an efficient breather, they can do more with less. They can go for a run with yeah. less air. And that's important because they're able to, they're just more economical with their use of air. They're not overtaxing their respiratory system. They're less likely to fatigue but they're more likely to not to gas out too soon. So, yeah. And that, that has to be so important to thinking, because uh, that's where my mind went to thinking about endurance athletes. Yes. You know, like the 100 meter sprint, it's such a short amount of time yes. that I imagine to your point, those might even be some of those individuals who would, would have a shockingly lower bolt score, may, possibly, maybe, maybe they don't. But like an endurance event, a marathon, a triathlon, it's like those efficiencies really start to matter yes. over the course of an extended amount of time. Yeah. Um, and actually, here, here's a question for you. Maybe maybe we can start to wrap it up. Um, you know, is it like for a marathon runner, would it be realistic to expect someone who's really trying to run a competitive marathon could do a whole marathon just nose breathing? It depends on or, their <clears throat> it depends on their nostril size. So, say for instance, oh, okay. an African, uh, different facial structure than a Caucasian. So yeah. me. I have one nostril smaller than the other. I have a deviated septum. So oh, you're, yeah. I would need to use a, a nasal dilator. So, you know, if, if some people have a very compromised nose, well, I suggested that they use a nasal dilator. And this way, so it'll depend yeah, on the... the nasal dilator? Is that like a, bre like a breathe right strip? A Does that right count? Or strip or on the you can have little ones like here. For example, you know, it's, this is a dilator here. This, is, this isn't a size that's going to fit me, but just to show you... Mm. It's just a little plastic device that goes up oh, into wow. the nose that helps to open up the nose. And uh, oh. it'll depend on bolt score. An individual with a decent bolt score is able to do more physical exercise with less air. And a person with a good, sufficient nasal airway or using a nasal dilator will be able to do it as well. But oh. I just want to make a point before I forget, Ken. Yeah, please. Repeated sprintability is a performance indicator in team sports. 
And this is the ability of an oh, athlete yeah. to do all out effort, followed by a very brief recovery and all out effort again. And mm-hmm. it applies to boxing, it applies to MMA, whatever, you know. So there was one study that was conducted in Australia with professional rugby union players. They were 21 years of age. They measured their repeated sprint ability before the test, and it was nine reps. Mm -hmm. They divided them into two groups. One group was doing breath hold training, the same breath holding that we do during 40 meter sprints. And the other group was doing high intensity interval training. And at the end of four weeks, the group who were doing breath hold training increased their repeated sprint ability from nine reps to 14.8. Wow. The group who was who were doing high intensity interval training increased it from nine to 10. Now, my wow. point here is these are elite rugby union professional players during peak season. And to have a gain between nine to 14.8 in a performance indicator in just four weeks. So... The reason that there's something well, in this is because, again, you know, there's something really in this. And for athletes who want to get that edge, because mm-hmm. it's only the innovators who are using this at the moment. Now, it's becoming more popular, but it still hasn't gone mainstream. So it'll That's be interesting. interesting. Well, and to your point, too, thinking about team sports, I mean, that that uh, someone else uh who I really respect was talking about just the importance of this, but I mean, that that's a difference of, you know, being flat and still coming on strong in the yes. fourth quarter. Right. Yeah. You know, so it's, it, it, it makes a massive difference. Yes. Right. And so, yeah, if you're someone who, you know, your team tends to fall flat at the end of a game, yes. uh, this might be a really interesting approach. And to your point, it's actually less taxing in a lot of ways uh, versus just trying to run these guys or gals to death. Yes, yes. And it's also looking, let's look at their everyday breathing patterns because you can have an athlete doing all of the training in the world. And -hmm. if this person is sleeping with an open mouth, if they're having their mouth open during light physical exercise, if the person is suffering from anxiety, whereby they have a, you know, a condition which is feeding into their breathing patterns. And it's very easy to bring this because like all I do is I look at, here's a person, I want you to bring these breathing exercises into their way of life. You know, mm. when you warm up, instead of doing your warm up with your mouth open, I want you to do your warm up with your mouth closed. Breathe in and out through your nose. If you're feeling anxious pre-competition during your warm up, get lateral expansion and contraction of the lower ribs to calm the mind. But before mm. that, improve your heart rate variability so you've got increased resilience. And then to stress the body a little bit before you go out into competition, do five breath holds because. The other aspect about this is that we have a blood bank called the spleen yeah, and it's located under the left side of the diaphragm and it contains 8% of our red blood cells and the quality of the blood inside the spleen is very high. 80% mm. of it is hematocrit, which they're richly, densely packed red blood cells. If you do a breath hold for 30 seconds, your spleen releases red blood cells into circulation. And it has a maximum effect up to five breath holds. So you can think of an athlete who is going out to to perform, to do an event. They do five long breath holds before it, a couple of minutes beforehand. Their spleen now has released red blood cells into circulation. And it takes between 10 and 60 minutes for the spleen to reabsorb that extra blood cells back. Now, the benefit of having increased red blood cells is increased oxygen carrying capacity. And this is the reason, for example, why Lance Armstrong, Lance Armstrong, these individuals taking EPO, taking different substances to increase their Mm. hematocrit, you know, and it was normal. I'm not blaming any cyclist. I think the system was at fault there that they left it wide open for athletes to take as much dope as they could and not to get not to get found out, you know. Hmm. That's incredible. So for, for people uh, who want to follow what you're doing, and I know that you also offer things like courses, uh, yeah. in addition to a number of the products that we kind of talked about today, some of which I'm going to put an order in here as soon as I, we get off this. <laughs> um, what, what's the best way for people to find you and follow you? Uh, we have different following. One is Instagram, Oxygen okay. Advantage, um, okay. a channel on YouTube, just put in Oxygen Advantage, website, oxygenadvantage.com. We also have restrictive training device is called sportsmask.com and then the myotape is myotape.com so you'll see different there's workshops as well i give two-hour workshops i also teach we have 
300 instructors across 50 countries for oxygen advantage as well. So, you know, it's, it's, it's getting out there. Yeah. Well, and that's what I was wondering too. Like, uh, you know, do you have um, programs for like, let's say, you know, someone at a university uh, hears this and they're really interested in starting to roll some of these techniques out uh, to the teams or the athletes that they work with? Yes. Uh, do, do they go to Oxygen Advantage for that? Yes. And I imagine they're yeah. training or program. Yeah. So we have full instructor training programs. We start again in about two weeks time uh, doing instructor training. And at the moment, of course, they're all they're virtual live, the same as what we're doing sure. here. Yeah. And it's all working out, you know, so the reach is getting out there. We have a back end as well. We've got our training manual is very extensive and videos and everything else that goes with it. Oh, perfect. Okay, great. Well, I'll, I'll make sure to link to all of that in the show notes as well. And uh, very excited for this new book to come out. Great. Well, looking maybe, forward maybe to it. Too. Yeah, maybe when it does, we can get you back out because I uh, would love to talk about that as well. Great stuff, Ken. More than happy. Awesome. Well, hey, thank you very much for joining the show. Likewise.